makes me terribly happy. Mm -hmm. um, our next introducer is Keith Gaston. Uh, we know Keith here around the Center for Fiction because of his wonderful fiction. Um, but let me add a little bit to that. He was born in Moscow and educated at Harvard and Syracuse. He's the author of All the Sad Young Literary Men, a wonderful book, and editor-in-chief of N Plus One magazine, a magazine that comes out twice yearly about literature, politics, and culture, um, and Marco is also a co-founder of N Plus One. He has written about books for Descent, Slate, and New York Magazine. Dubbed, um, and this is my favorite part of your bio, uh, Keith, he was dubbed the literary heartthrob by Gawker.com. <laughs> and here's Keith. Join me in welcoming you. Thank you. They were making fun of me. <laughs> but thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Marco Roth. Um, I have been saying it's a pleasure and a vindication because I've been saying for years that Marco Roth is one of the best critics writing in English. Um, and I've said it on the internet. It's a matter of public record. Um, so to everyone out there, I want to say I told you so. Um, a, a few things about M plus one for, for people who don't know about it. Uh, we started it seven years ago in 2004. Uh, the idea was to find a place where we could write at length um, and we could write about literature, but to do it, to bring literature into the public sphere um, and to bring uh, history and politics and culture into the conversation about literature. Um, that has meant different things to different writers for N plus one. Um, for me, it's meant writing a lot about Russia. Uh, for one of our co-editors, Mark Greif, it's meant taking on some of the big news issues of the day. He's written about the Iraq War uh, and the Iliad. He's written about uh, Octomom, uh, which is something I had not known about until Mark wrote uh, 8,000 words about the woman who gave birth to eight babies all at once and then was blamed for the financial crisis. Um, because the babies were had to be supported by the state. Um, and uh, Benjamin Kunkel, who's here, um, he has become an economist. Uh, he is uh, a, a wonderful novelist, but he has actually re-educated himself as a Marxist economist. Uh, for Marco, it has meant um, something different. It's meant, it's been, I feel, more organic. It has come out of his uh, deep reading, uh, his, uh, his various interests. So um, Marco, uh, his very first piece he wrote about us, uh, he wrote for N plus one, um, was about Dale Peck, um, a, uh, the hatchet man, uh, a critic who was, if you'll recall, and, and many people now don't recall, um, he went on a tirade in about 2002, 2003, 2004, um, and Marco, uh, in, in one of his first pieces, defined uh, what a negative criticism ought to look like. Um, he felt this was not what a negative criticism ought to look like. Um, in, the, in the years since, he has written about uh, the clone novel, the neuro novel. He has written about the homologies between torture and parenting. Um, he has written about, uh, there's an incredible passage, I was, I've, I've been going through the Marco Roth archive, um, and uh, there's an incredible passage at the beginning of Torture and Parenting, uh, where uh, Marco and his then wife uh, are smoking a cigarette as, um, as their, their daughter uh, is crying. And um, they're outside, and, and they're being, they have been told by the uh, experts on child rearing that you must uh, leave the, uh, your daughter alone and let her cry. Uh, and it feels to them like torture. What is the name of these people, Marco? The fur The fur yes. But, also, but they call it extinguishing, right? Yes. Yes, the extinguishers. There's several degrees of extinguishing. 
Yes. Uh, it's a very powerful, and it, and it's, it actually, well, it, it, um, it, it brought it, it, it brought to mind uh, George Steiner's um, is this on purpose. You know, George Steiner has this, <laughs> he has these passages where he talks about uh, the people listening. Oh, and you're listening to uh, Strauss. Yes. Yes. And uh, yes. And uh, George George Steiner has these. Uh, uh, passages where he talks about the, the people uh, in the Munich uh, concert halls uh, listening to uh, Strauss and um, the, while the trains are going to Dachau. So um, there's a kind of, there's always something in the background of Marco's criticism. Um, it has a dialectical, uh, what, we, what we used to call dialectical um, rigor, uh, which is the inheritance, I think, of uh, the New York intellectuals. Uh, when we were starting our magazine, we were often defining ourselves or comparing ourselves to the New York intellectuals. Um, but Marco was the only one who was actually from New York, <laughs> which, which gave him um, a nice advantage. Uh, ben, ben Kunkel once said um, that Marco is the only person he knows who is a full-time human being. Um, I think I think partly he meant that Marco didn't seem to have a job, uh, but he also he also meant um, that 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 he uh, that he he was he was committed to um, looking at all the facets of life and understanding them, um, writing criticism about them, and having his criticism be informed um, by all the arts and all the politics. Um, I I've been trying to define what is so wonderful and pleasurable about rereading Marco's work. Um, I, and I, I, I think it's the fact that his dialectical rigor is also in, infused with a certain, uh, something French. Um, and and I, don't, I, I, I don't quite know what that means. I don't know what it means to be French. Um, uh, although we have a wonderful Exemplar of French culture here, um, but but there was one piece in particular that Marco wrote uh, that I thought uh, encapsulated some of this, and it, it, it's a piece that he wrote in 2005, I think, and um, it was about Ask Cleavage. Uh, it's called A Nation Divided, or Ask Cleavage, about the uh, the big argument that it I think it took place in 2005 um, over the question of, of thong underwear. If you'll recall, it was a big public issue. Um, <laughs> And I just, want to, I just want to quote a little bit from this piece because I think it gives, it gives a sense of, of what Marco does. Um, he says, the same people who failed to take Bush seriously in 2001 and still sneered their way to defeat in November are back sneering again at the new America. Argument by and about one example. In a recent column, Maureen Dowd used a proposed Virginia law on banning low-riding jeans and the exposure of thongs as an example of the Republicans' hypocritical drive to curtail the very American freedoms they bought as a mandate for global hegemony. Hypocrisy, sure. After decades of oppression, the Shiite women of Iraq should be allowed to wear thongs if they want. But what's really interesting here is not Virginia's new law, but what Dowd's column makes of it. Uh, Marco then explains how Maureen Dowd is the Mary Antoinette of um, <laughs> contemporary American culture. <laughs> he explains um, that there is a problem with the idea that uh, you can't stop progress. That saying contains the fossil of an old 19th century idea, both Marxist and liberal, and it is now as complacent as whatever is is right, the conservative slogan it replaced. You can't refight the sexual revolution, these people think, because the sexual revolution is history. If you believe this, however, you are not a revolutionary, but a fatalist, a Hegelian, or a Marxist without the physical and intellectual energy of the generation of 1968. Revolution, as suggested by the prefix, means precisely the return to an earlier point, even if that point is imaginary. The Democrats and the rump of the mainstream left still think that progress and revolution are synonyms. This is one more reason why the revolutionary energy of America is all drifted to the right. Progressives had a laugh about one of the Bush administration's terms of contempt for the media elites and thinkers, the reality-based community. But why did we laugh? Don't we want to emulate them? Their sneering is the sneering of the true revolutionary. And the piece, uh, after explaining why fighting for the thong is uh, perhaps not the wisest political strategy for the left, <laughs> concludes with this. 
Corporations have destroyed liberalism and feminism in so many ways, including morally. Their fashions, sold with sex since they, see, since they lack other selling points, do not deserve a liberal's hard-earned political capital. The injudicious defense of Hollywood violence, mainstream pornography, and bad art, along with the intellectual supervaluation of these same phenomena by people and institutions self-identified with the left, has helped us bring us to our current pass. Ah, when one's political fortunes ride as low as one's genes. <laughs> Let them eat cake, became the epitaph of, the Fr of France's ancient regime. Let them wear thongs, might be ours. Um, I think uh, we have all, uh, at N plus one, tried to combine uh, literature and history and politics, but no one has done it with quite so much style as Marco Roth. Here he is. Okay, I'm not going to have to throw this away and just do footnotes to uh, Keith's wonderful introduction. <laughs> Blushing. Um, and then I also realized how angry I was in 2005, which will come out in this, in this story that I thought I was going to tell, but now I have to do footnotes. Uh, footnote one, uh, being French. Uh, when Keith said that just now, I, realized, I remember that there was this, uh, this moment when I was still a graduate student, uh, when one of my favorite professors, David Bromwich, uh, from whom I sometimes feel like I've learned absolutely everything, uh, was we were talking about uh, Henry James, and he sort of threw out there, he said, uh, it was a key to, he had assigned for some reason the art of fiction and, Paul Demont, and along with the Paul Demont's The Rhetoric of Temporality to try to do an experiment on the graduate student mind of what happens when you put uh, uh, theory and uh, a writer writing theory together. And he said, uh, Henry James says, you should be one of those people on whom nothing is lost. What would Paul Demont say? And I just had this flash and I said, be one of those people for whom loss is everything. <laughs> and, you know, I thought I was very clever, but he looked at me and he just said, that was very Parisian. <laughs> and I thought, well, what does it mean, Parisian? You know? <laughs> and, I, and I asked him, I was like, well, you know, what? And it meant it was that somehow my language was ahead of my thought, because I, didn't, I wasn't yet sure what it meant to be one of those people for whom loss is everything. Uh, although I think, some years I've tried to be that person uh, with terrible success. Uh, but you should know my, my daughter is fine. Uh, she's now six and a half years old. She's, she's great at, uh, she, she has great drawing skills. And, uh, so no, no harm was done, despite the uh, experiment and metaphor that the essay torture and parenting was. That was for that's for number two. Uh, so where I was going to start uh, is that I've never really been any good or comfortable with winning things. And when I got the this surprising email from Noreen, my it let me know that there was this thing called the Shattuck Prize, and uh, I'd won it. Uh, my first thought was that I was mistaken for Mark Greif, uh, <laughs> who is another M plus one co-founder and, and editor. And we're often confused for each other. Um, <laughs> since we started Apple's one in 2004, I would get emails thanking me for taking time I hadn't taken to read books and submissions I hadn't read. Uh, emails that were addressed, Dear Mark Roth, or Dear Mark of Greif, or one uh, that I think began, Dear Mr. Mark Rothko Greif, <laughs> My parents, probably like yours, were hippie artists. <laughs> so this sort of thing, after a while, will wear away at your sense of self. And I was, I was sincerely tempted to accept Mark's award for him, uh, not just on his behalf, but as an actual double and a placeholder and a composite on one because Mark had really been writing long, persuasive articles about Hannah Arendt and Don DeLillo in places 
like Descent at a time when I was still writing capsule reviews for Publishers Weekly. So I read Noreen's email over again, expecting to see a mention of one of Mark's favorite, uh, or one of my favorite essays of Mark's, like uh, Radiohead and the Philosophy of Pop, which is a great reading of the not just the lyrics of Radiohead, but how, but the music and how it works together uh, as a as a critique of pop music from within pop music, and which is it's, it's a great essay on music. Um, or I also thought maybe the, the email would mention. Uh, this great essay on uh, Jonathan Francis' Freedom as a novel of our contemporary crisis of liberalism, uh, which yeah, you can read about in uh, issue 10, or issue, issue 10 of M plus 1, which is now three times a year, I want to say, uh, as well. Uh, so I scanned the email looking for that, and I didn't, I didn't see any references to Mark's work. Uh, and then I realized that uh, my name was actually spelled correctly. But even as I was sort of forced to believe the email was actually addressed to me, I, I wanted to remain faithful to, to my instinct that it couldn't have been intended for me. <laughs> At least not for me alone, because the kind of literary criticism I've been able to write and publish is a sort that we often used to hear was no longer possible or dying out on account of cultural, economic, professional, and technological factors that we'll be talking about all of us in a few minutes. Uh, by myself, as myself, at that in 2004, not even with the modest rank of junior professor, I would not have been able to publish a long comparative essay speculating on why two established novelists, both practitioners of a certain strain of psychological realism, one Japanese-British, Kazuo Shiguro, the other French, Michel Welbeck, almost simultaneously and yet unknown to each other, had both taken up the subject of human cloning, previously confined to science fiction. Now, it's true that I could have had the same thoughts that developed into that essay on literary cloning, but they would have been pushed into the background of a drunken conversation or into the semi-oblivious half-thoughts of insomniac nights spent worrying about publishing my dissertation or how to tailor them into an attention-grabbing pitch for a freelance assignment, in sort of the, in the genre that I was describing in her conversation with New York Times. You know, I had no clips to show who was going to publish my essay on cloning. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't even make up some articles in French. My French isn't that good. Uh, so I would really, you know, the only way that I could write this piece is if there was a magazine that, that was created especially to publish this kind of work that was an outsider work at the time that was, that was found, that, that people felt was uh, increasingly not worthwhile or too difficult or, you know, all the complaints that people have. So I'm, I'm really honored to, to accept the award on behalf of my fellow co-founders and editors of Plus One, uh, that's Chad Harbach, Keith Gesson, Mark Greif, who's not here, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ben Kunkel, who is, uh, Alison Lorenzen, who's also, is Alison here? Alison? Um, well, some of us have made it. Uh, M Plus One could never have existed without all of them and provided a place for unknown critics to write something more than plot summaries and author profiles, which is what we um, I'd especially like to thank Ben uh, for that, in that line that uh, Keith quoted about uh, oh, for, uh, that our fortune should ride should ride as low as our genes. Ben wrote that line, <laughs> um, and he's an especially wonderful literary critic in his own right, and author of great critical appreciations of Pessoa, D. H. Lawrence, Jane Katzia, among others as well as reflections on the avant-garde and uh, elitism that have importantly influenced my own thinking. And Ben has been the ideal editor and interlocutor for much of my critical work, the kind of editor who's also said to be an endangered species, someone who possesses the negative capability to inhabit other people's arguments down to the level of a sentence, the kind of editor who helps you see when you've swallowed a thought half-finished or accidentally obscured a crucial point that you hardly credited as important, by making a sentence over long or over elaborate, like this one is becoming. <laughs> so in case I've been unclear, thank you, Ben, for really taking me out of the private language of lonely and unanchored thought that I inhabit. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there's a secondary intellectual point behind this gratitude. Um, and that is that, that criticism has typically been a social art. 
from its ancient roots among teachers of rhetoric, that is to say, the art of persuasion, uh, up through the evolution of conversational English critical style, and the spectator and the rambler, to the heated political cultures of modernism, whether the New York immigrant kind found in partisan review, dissent and commentary, or the American aesthetico-conservative vein struck by T.S. Eliot's criterion and the Southern fugitives. Criticism, as opposed to both professionalized academic scholarship and the modern cultural consumer report of the book review, has most often thrived under conditions where ideas, tastes, forms, theories, and fantasies can be played with among small groups of people who view each other essentially as equals, united by shared tastes and modes of thinking and writing, but also, because these are groups of equals, able to tolerate a high degree of mutual disagreement and almost antisocial experimentation. And often these groups formed in, del in deliberate opposition to what was seen as the deadened or deadening dominant modes of thought in their time. They formed adversary cultures, in Lionel Trilling's famous phrase, not so much deliberately as chaotically, out of a sense of necessity. I, and I feel like I've been fortunate enough to have been a part of such an adventure among such productively alienated people. <laughs> a, a group that's expanded since the magazine began to include Elizabeth Bituman, A.S. Hamra, Nikhil Saval, Elizabeth Gumport, Carla Blumenkrantz, Charles Peterson, and Maury Weigel, as well as among those who remember me as unproductively, as, as the unproductively alienated person I used to be, uh, and whose conversation and example were instrumental to snap me out of it, uh, Ilya Klieger and Nasser Zakaria, both here. Uh, and so for me, the sustaining power of such antisocial sociability is something that good criticism can also offer to readers at a remove, but only under certain under circumstances of dissatisfaction or discomfort, uh, like the one that I was in uh, when I wrote the piece on uh, Ask the Image that Keith uh, put it. Uh, in the seven years since the founding of M plus one in 2004, it's, however, become more difficult, though not impossible, to find grounds for productive dissatisfaction. What large problems remain the, in the chaotic liquidation of the West, which is a so economy phrase that I came across today as I was looking for this. We are now in a different age of the chaotic liquidation of the West. But the, those problems now seem to be beyond the means of culture to, to repair. And I certainly feel less angry and more, you know, I may be moving into early middle-aged resignation dangerously. Uh, and so what, what you can see, maybe, if you're ahead of me here, is uh, the familiar outlines of the of a history of most cultural and critical avant-garde, which is a quiet tragedy of progress from radical opposition to lazy dominance, the seemingly inevitable move by which an adversary culture replaces and becomes the commonplace culture it once targeted. This movement is captured as if in a time-lapse photograph by Roger Shaddock at the end of his book, The Banquet Years, when he describes an actual banquet dinner or awards ceremony staged by the French serialists where they invited the previous generation of fantasy siècle avant-gardists and mocked them as the stately bourgeois many of them had, in fact, become. So perhaps it occurred to me just last night that my, my initial sense that the award must be some kind of mistake was a way of deflecting the fear that I might be emerging into respectability and attacked by the surrealists in the room tonight. <laughs> and that I'd be less and less able to write from the dark sense of grievance and outrage and at times almost visceral disgust that used to goad me out of torpor and into writing. Could it be that the recognition of the critic's work, like recognition of an artist's work, simultaneously dulls the power of animating that work? What I soon say to myself is Alfred Kazin, one of my forebearers among New York Jewish intellectual critics, once confided to his journal, quote, I, who stood so long outside the door, wondering if I would ever get through it, am now one of the standard bearers of American literary opinion, a judge of young men. Is this path from outsider to standard bearer, from revolutionary seeking to change bad laws in the hope of some kind of aesthetic and moral justice, to just to normalizing judge, the only road a critic can follow? And I hope this public self-questioning doesn't sound ungracious. But it did seem to me that this staging of ambivalence might be a good way to honor the spirit of Roger Shattuck, whose work powerfully charts the dialectic of autonomy and appropriation in the European avant-garde, and whose sensitivity to the dynamics of distancing and self-distancing in art can be glimpsed immediately in the title of one of his books, Truths Binoculars. 
perhaps two I should think of this prize, only, which is only in its second year, not so much as a feared temptation from a respectful eminence, and more like a tap on the shoulder from a monetary angel, signaling to us that we're approaching a point where we'll have to wrestle our way through a tangle of dilemmas, some perennial, some specific to our time and place, in order to cultivate for ourselves as critics the world that will appear to us on the other side. And for that tap, I'm very grateful.